the price of oil. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flask along with their lamps. Matthew 25, 3 and 4. They that were foolish took their lamps of an outward profession. They would go to church, say their prayers, come perhaps into a field to hear a sermon, give a collection, and receive the sacrament constantly, nay, oftener than once a month. But then here lies the mistake. They had no oil in their lamps, no principle of grace, no living faith in their hearts. In one word, they never effectively felt the power of the world to come. They thought they might be Christians without so much inward feeling. While I've been trying to draw for you a miniature photo of the character of these foolish virgins, have not many of your consciences made the application and with a small, still, though articulate voice said, Thou man, thou woman, art one of those foolish virgins. For your sentiments and practice are similar. Strifle not, but rather encourage these convictions, and who knows but that the Lord who is rich in mercy to all that call upon him, faithfully may so work upon you, even by this foolishness of preaching, as to make you wise virgins before you return home. The wise virgins had their lamps. Herein did not lie the difference between them and the foolish that one worshipped God with a form and the other did not. No, as the Pharisee and the publican went up to the temple to pray, so these wise and foolish virgins might go to the same place of worship and sit under the same ministry. But then the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They kept up the form but didn't rest in it. Their words in prayer were the language of their hearts, and they were no strangers to inward feelings. They were not afraid of searching doctrines, nor affronting when ministers told them they deserved to be damned. They were not self-righteous, but they were willing that Jesus Christ should have all the glory of their salvation. They were convinced that the merits of Jesus Christ were to be apprehended only by faith. But yet were they as careful to maintain good works as though they were to be justified by them. In short, their obedience flowed from love and gratitude and was cheerful, constant, uniform, universal, like that obedience which the holy angels pay our Father in heaven, see. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day or the hour. Matthew 25, 13. Every generation of Christians has expected Christ to return in their lifetime. And they have had one thing in common. They have all been wrong. Let's just suppose that Jesus said, I'll give you three millennia to evangelize the world, and then on January 1, AD 3000, I will return at precisely 9 GMT. What would the promise of his return have meant to generations or believers who lived in the preceding centuries? In the midst of their sufferings, exiles, and martyrdom, what comfort would they have derived from his promise, knowing that he would not come soon? And what would have been the effect on the church if they had known that they still had a little time to do what they wanted to do? That is before doing or getting around to doing what he had told them to do. Where would have been the sense of urgency, the challenge of holiness, 
and the keen sense of tiptoe anticipation. Jesus' point was that all his disciples should be living in a sense of anticipation, actively on the job, working hand to bring about the consummation of his purposes and living consistent lives so they would not be ashamed of his coming. The price of oil, pay it.